Joining us now from Irvine, California, is Scott Sperling, co-president of Thomas H. Lee Partners, a powerhouse in the world of private equity, which is putting money into established media. So, uh, Scott, first of all, uh, this is a show about technology and innovation, and I want to know how is the fast-changing world of technology impacting or changing what you are looking for in new investments? I think we look at technology as an opportunity to marry very strong franchises, particularly in the media sector and the information uh, services sector, with new technologies that enable these companies to serve their customer base, both more cost efficiently, but also with uh, much better levels of service and much broader levels of service. So if you could marry uh, a company like Clear Channel, whose radio division has 150 million people a day who tune in, 89% uh, of people uh, still listen to radio at least two hours a day. They have 850 radio stations and the strongest programming, local driven programming as well as very strong national programming. If you can take that and make sure that people have the ability to access that in any form that they want, whenever they want, whether they're mobile outside of a car, inside of a car, or in their home, give them the ability to help manipulate some of that in ways that they uh, find attractive then I think you have the best of both worlds. Now, speaking of radio, we've been covering Pandora, the internet radio, sure. IPO, as well as other disruptive startups in the online music business. You just had a successful exit from Warner Music. How did all of that disruption in the music industry, how did you use that to turn Warner around? Well, we, um, as a firm, our uh, strategy, our focus is on finding good companies where we can uh, work with management teams, often people that we bring in, like Edgar Bronfman, uh, who is our partner at Warner Music, um, and then recruit very strong teams to the operating divisions, work with those teams to try to upgrade the operating performance of uh, those various divisions. In the Warner Music situation, we were able to take a company that was one of the, the best uh, companies uh, in an industry with a very long heritage that had run into problems because of changes in technology and work with that company to dramatically increase its market shares kind of across the board to restructure it in ways where it was much more efficient but also where it could become an innovator in delivering its uh, strong content to uh, uh, people uh, again in, uh, in any way that that they want. So the company was able uh, to uh, take significant market share. Uh, U.S. market share went up from the low teens to over 20 percent, uh, and it was able to do that very cost effectively. And that's really a tribute to uh, the management team that um, uh, we had partnered with, uh, that we brought into the company as our partners, uh, people like Edgar Bronfman and uh, Lior Cohen. Now, EMI is another big music label that is now up for sale. What do you think the bidding process for EMI is going to look like, and, and do you think Warner is a potential buyer? Well, I think there's always been strong industrial logic to merge the recorded music businesses of Warner and EMI. There are significant cost savings with coming from combining those cost structures to deliver that content uh, in a combined fashion. So there's always some logic uh, behind that. I would say our experience at Warner Music is that there's still very broad interest on the part of investors, both strategic and financial, in the recorded music business and the music publishing business, and I would expect that uh, that interest um, uh, will uh, transfer over to the EMI process, where both um, uh, Warner Music uh, would be a natural buyer, but uh, there will be interest from uh, others, both financial and strategic, strategic as well. All right, Scott, I want to bring in our editor-at-large, Corey sure. Johnson, who's been looking at some of the other investments in your portfolio. Corey? Yeah, I'm struck by the fact that you're investing in media and technology, and, but as a private equity firm on some level, are you focused on free cash flow as an ultimate goal or even cash flow just without free cash flow? Well, um, we are highly focused uh, and have been for uh, probably 30 years on free cash flow as the key metric. Now, when we talk to the world, we often use EBITDA or other measures of profitability that is more normally used in the public markets. But uh, as a firm, uh, the key metric for us is free cash flow. So we look well, at that, ways that can't help you much if you're that can't help you much if you're trying to invest in technology companies because that seems to be a, a, a dying art. 
well, the creation I, I think, of free cash flow. Yeah, I think what um, we're focused on is making investments in technology that lead to significant increases in free cash flow. And you can find technology companies that have reasonably strong margins and have a business model that allows them to generate significant, uh, significant free cash flow. Uh, and particularly as you look at the cost today of implementing digital technologies, it's so much lower than it was even five or 10 years ago that the ability to use those tools and use the implementation of digital technology to again grow a, uh, grow a business reasonably rapidly um, with a level of investment that can lead to significant free cash flow generation uh, is something that we, we find to be a growing trend as opposed to uh, something that's diminishing. Scott, I want to get you to weigh in on another, another story that Bloomberg News has been reporting about ex-Skype employees who say that because of a quote-unquote clawback clause no. in their contract, they lost vested shares that Silver Lake ultimately bought back. Do private equity firms approach contracts and deals differently than venture capitalists? Uh, I, I, we always view, and I know uh, the folks at Silver Lake, uh, I think, share this, uh, pretty strongly share this view uh, as well, that management uh, is a key partner of ours in our ambition to really uh, buy into good companies and turn them into great companies. And so you want management to share in the rewards for that, and you want the reputation of, of, uh, of being a firm that enriches management teams. Um, I can't address any of the specifics on uh, that report because I'm not really that familiar with it. Uh, but I do know that, that most private equity players, most buyout firms uh, are strongly of uh, the same belief as I've just articulated. That said, private equity is kind of getting a bit of a bad rap in the blogosphere out here because of this Skype story. Equity yep. is such a big part of the Silicon Valley dream. Is this something that employees of technology companies should be concerned about going forward if they're acquired by PE firms? No, I, I actually, again, I think quite the opposite. Our goal is to align the interests of the management team, our investors, and uh, ourselves as active uh, board members and participants in uh, the process of moving companies to higher levels of operating performance. And in that regard, you know, as I said, we really want the management team right. to benefit, and it's a key part of our investment thesis. So I All would right. think that, um, that it will be very similar to what you've seen on the uh, venture-backed um, side, the venture capital side. Okay, thanks so much for your thoughts on that. Scott Sperling of Thomas You're H. Lee Partners, always great to have you on Bloomberg Television. You're